Serious therapists, what is something people are afraid to tell you because they think it's weird, but that you've actually heard a lot of times before? Two topics come up with regularity, when someone discloses to me that they were sexually abused as a kid, and or when some is experiencing suicidal ideation. Both are something I hear from clients every single day, and so I don't find it weird at all. But, when I have someone in front of me who's talking about it for the first time, I know it's important to validate the fact that even though I might be talking about this for like the fifth time that day, they have never talked about this ever, and are in need of gentle care to feel safe. Yes. That validation was life-changing for me. I talked about my early childhood sexual trauma to a few people and counselors to try to process and was often told that what I went through, wasn't that bad, or someone else had it worse. It wasn't until a few years ago that our marriage counselor validated my feelings in front of my husband that I truly felt heard and was able to start healing. I'd say a common one is believing that there's something innately, irreparably wrong with them that makes them unable to ever truly fit in. For a lot of people it's such a deeply ingrained belief that it can be extremely painful to acknowledge or express, regardless of the level of personal success in their lives. The worst is knowing beyond doubt that you are holding a false belief about yourself and yet not being able to change it. I've spent long enough in therapy trying to figure out what's wrong with me to know there's no, there, there, but the ingrained pattern of thinking doesn't go away. That they do not know what they enjoy doing. Often they have people in their life, including therapists, say, try to do something fun today, or ask, what do you like to do when you have free time? Many people I work with do not know what those are. Once I explain that I dislike these statements, questions because they assume people should know the answer, and that many people don't, I can watch as they relax, take a deep breath, and say something to the effect of, oh my, that's so good to hear. I have no idea what I like to do. That's part of the problem. More often than not they feel like they should know and that everyone else their age has it figured out. They are embarrassed to say that they don't know when in fact not knowing is very common. I couldn't even try to count how many clients I've had this conversation with. Psychologist here. Basically, anything having to do with sex. There's so much shame, sexual abuse, sexual fantasies and fetishes, erectile dysfunction, infidelity, becoming sexually assertive. I've been told that I have a good psychologist's face. I try not to have a strong reaction to normalize the discussion. With adolescents, they are extremely anxious to tell me if they've relapsed or aren't doing well. They cut one night or they were suicidal. They're having a lot of negative self-talk or panic attacks. They'll come in, pretending everything is okay. It's usually in the last 10 to 15 minutes that they'll say something. They'll reveal that they worried they'd let me down. That I'd be disappointed in them. It usually turns into a discussion about policing other people's feelings and tolerating emotions. I explain that I care about their well-being and it's my job to monitor my emotions and reactions, not their role. Those last 15 minutes of a session are when I spew out all the best stuff to my therapist. And then I feel a negative emotion that I brought it up at the end and can't finish talking about it. A common one in the time I was a therapist was simply, I don't know. You'd be surprised how reluctant people are to admit that they don't know why they're feeling how they are. But that's exactly why you're, or what, I'm not a therapist anymore, sat there with me, so we can figure out why together. It always put me in mind of a line from America by Simon and Garfunkel. Kathy, I'm lost, I said, though I knew she was sleeping. I'm empty and aching and I don't know why. That Simon and Garfunkel line is one of my favorites ever. It's so full of emotion. It's beautiful and sad. Unwanted intrusive thoughts are normal and do not mean you are a bad person. Yes, even intrusions of sexual, religious, moral themes. By definition, these are thoughts that are unwanted bc they go against your own values and highlight what you don't want to do, e.g., a religious person having unwanted blasphemous images pop into their mind, or a new parent having unwanted sexual thoughts about their new baby. However normal these thoughts are, over 90% of the population, the moral nature of these thoughts mean that often people experience a lot of shame and take many years before they first tell someone about them. Edit. Because this is getting more visibility that I realized, the occurrence of these thoughts, images, urges are normal. The best way to manage them is to accept that they are a normal, albeit unpleasant, brain process, and a sign of the opposite of who you are and are therefore v. v. unlikely to ever do. Let the thought run its course in the background while you bring your attention back to it. Insert something you can see, feel, hear, taste, touch. I usually say something like, okay mind. Thanks for that mind. I'm going to get back to washing the dishes and the sound, sensation of the water while you ponder all the nasties. 
carry on, I literally say it to myself with a slightly amused tone bc I am always genuinely amused at all the wild stuff my brain can produce. With my last baby, I would suddenly think to myself, what if I just drop her on the floor? Was horrified for a bit before I realized it was normal. So every time I would think about something like that I would complete the thought. What if I drop the baby? Baby could die. I would go to jail. That would really suck. Let's not drop the baby. ETA I didn't think this comment would be seen by many. It was a quickly written response. In order of importance the first thing that would be horribly wrong with dropping my child is that she could die. That would be the worst. But then there is also the possibility of jail. Which was why it was second. So for everyone thinking that my biggest concern is jail it's not. Clients become quite fearful of admitting that they weren't successful since the last time they had a session. This could include not succeeding in using a coping skill that they're learning about, or not being able to complete a homework assignment I gave them. Humans aren't robots, and therapy is a lot of work. That being said, I don't expect people to be perfect as they start to work on themselves in a positive way. It takes time to really commit to change, especially in relation to trauma or conflicted views that an individual holds. I feel as if the client doesn't want to let me down as their therapist, but these failure events are just as important to talk about as successful moments. I had to learn this lesson as a client. I suffer with ADHD and struggled immensely with starting and completing my graduate work when I was getting my master's, to the point of sometimes making no progress and not completing any work and putting my student status in jeopardy. My therapist had an idea for me to text him at the end of each day to let him know what I had gotten done, as a way of holding myself accountable to someone else. However, I struggled to even do that and after two days, stopped texting him because I still wasn't completing any work and was too embarrassed to tell him. When I came in for my session the following week, I very clearly looked embarrassed and couldn't properly look him in the eye. He said, dude, you're coming in here looking like you just killed someone or something. It's okay, you're going to make progress and it's okay if you're not successful at first, it's all a part of learning to improve. You don't need to be scared or embarrassed if you don't succeed the first time. If you don't complete any work, just tell me. I'm not going to be mad at you, I'm here to encourage you and help you manage yourself better. It really helped to hear that because I put so much pressure on myself even though my ability to do things normally is compromised. I still see the same therapist, he's great and has helped me improve a lot since then. That they don't like their family members, are angry, want to stop communication with their parents etc. I work in a country which is more culturally collectivist, so not wanting anything to do with your parents makes you an asshole in the current cultural sense. We deal with this almost on a daily basis. There is deep and profound shame in this and when we find that line of, oh, it might be that your parents are toxic to your mental well-being, trigger your trauma, many of my clients actually get visibly angry with me. Cultural psychology is so important, cause when I first moved here I had my American, European hat on, oh boy, did I need to adjust. Edit, I'm in Ukraine, Ukraine. Hypersexuality after some sort of sexual trauma. Psychologist in the US. To name a few, compulsive, masturbation, fears of being a pedophile, rapist, this is a common OCD fear, hoarding, sexual performance difficulties, history of sexual abuse or sexual assault, unfortunately it is very common, de use, amount of money spent on various things, having an ASD diagnosis, going back to an abusive relationship, staying in an abusive relationship, grieving years and years after a loss, self-harm of all sorts, wanting to abandon their current lifestyle, for example, to have more sex, to escape responsibility or expectations, history of gang violence, crime, their sexuality, or asexuality, gender identity, the impact of racism, racial trauma, paranoia, hallucinations, feeling uncomfortable in therapy, not believing in therapy, difficulty trusting a therapist, fear of psychiatric medication, fear of doctors in general. I was surprised to see suicidal ideation on others' responses. Most of my clients seem to talk very openly about suicidal thoughts and urges from the start of therapy, which I think is super healthy. I think that most of the people I've worked with had SI, current or history. As weird as it may seem, I can't imagine what a life without any thoughts about suicide would even look like. At this point, I don't recall a time a patient said something in therapy and I was shocked or even thought, oh, that's new. And Imo, if you surprise your therapist, that is okay. I wonder if we asked Reddit, what are you afraid to tell anyone, even a therapist, because you think it is weird? 
how many people would see that they aren't that weird at all. I was seeing my therapist, who I think is great and was super comfortable with, for depression and anxiety, and I still never told her about my suicidal thoughts because in my mind that would totally change things and it'd get serious. I work with a lot of anxiety and trauma clients whenever I ask if they would describe their experience as being anxious about being anxious, I get a lot of, OMG, yes. Anxiety has such a physical impact in the body, heart pounding, trouble breathing, feeling faint or cold, tunnel vision, that we become aware of our body's reaction before we even notice the anxious thoughts triggering the reaction. Then we panic about why our bodies are flipping out when we're not even aware of feeling threatened, and the anxiety compounds on itself. Anxiety is like an alarm system in our bodies to signal the presence of real or perceived danger. What would you do if your alarm was going off at your house? Check to see if there's a real threat, scan your environment, situation to ground yourself in the present, turn off the alarm, breathing exercises do help, along with mindfulness techniques like body scans, and then investigate what tripped the alarm, process thoughts around the situation that read like danger to you. It's also important to note that danger doesn't need to be a gun getting pulled on you. Panicking during a presentation that could impact your job and threaten the way you pay your bills and afford your life can feel pretty dangerous if you think about it. Edit, I'm an anxious person myself, and I respond really well to learning, knowing more about an issue. If you're interested, look into polyvagal theory. It goes into great detail around the mind-body response when it comes to anxiety and trauma. Here's a YouTube video that talks about it in kind of a laid-back, TED Talk meets comic at a bar kind of way, link. I am going through this right now. I get anxiety about having anxiety and even though I am not in any real danger, my anxious thoughts just grow and grow until I'm having a panic attack. Hidden sexual dreams and fantasies about family members. More common than people think, and often stays that way and doesn't really interfere in the person's close relationships unless they allow it. Many things we dream or think are unconscious and involuntary, and the root of such things is often nonsensical. Greater than many things we dream or think are unconscious and involuntary, and the root of such things is often nonsensical. This thread in its entirety had been very heartening, and this sentence in particular is immediately helpful and relevant to my experience. Thank you for expressing it so succinctly. I do a lot of trauma work. Many people who have experienced molestation or sexual assault feel ashamed and confused because their bodies responded. Having an erection, lubrication or even an orgasm does not mean you wanted the sexual contact and it is still assault. Clients often hold a lot of shame and confusion about this. They wonder if it means they wanted it or if there is something wrong with them. It is a tough thing to work through because of this. Assault is assault. Sometimes human bodies respond to sexual touch even when we don't want that touch. Edited to say. Wow. Thanks for the awards and likes. I hope that anyone reading this who is struggling with feeling weird about their reactions to RP assault, unwanted touch feels reassured. I also hope you find a good therapist or a good friend to talk to about this. It is one part of your life story but it isn't the story of you. You get to craft the narrative of your life. Maybe this is a chapter in that story, but it is not the whole thing. Trauma is a thing we experience, it doesn't get to define who we are. Someone once said it's like tickling. You laugh when you get tickled even though you don't want someone to tickle you. Usually it's sex-related. Shame about their desires or kinks is common. Gender questioning is another. Some people are ashamed of things they did in childhood or adolescence, haven't ever told anyone and think the team will be horrified. We have heard everything, everything. I'm always compassionate and always understand why we do the things we do. I've yet to have anyone bring something I can't get. What would you consider a healthy way to deal with past actions we are ashamed of? Seek to understand why. So, if it was say, stealing, the part of us that stole, had a good reason for doing that. It could be, I needed the money, thing, it made me feel better because I was lonely, I was angry at them, so I took something. It almost always comes from an unmet need, money, love, acceptance, to be valued, important etc. We do everything in aid of our survival. If you can be curious about the positive outcome you sought and the need you were meeting through the behavior it helps to then have compassion. Example. I've heard of abuse victims then experimenting with other children and feeling terrible guilt and shame. When explored, it showed that they sought to have control, to connect, to feel some sense of agency, to be less alone. All of which is completely understandable and to a degree, worked. They did feel connected, in the only way they knew how. They did feel a sense of agency and control. That helped them survive. They weren't trying to cause harm to another child, only to be less alone with their own pain. 
This behavior had not continued into adulthood and they were seeking peace. Knowing this helped them to care for the child in them who had suffered so much. To let go of the guilt and shame and start to live more. They sought to learn how to play, how to have fun, how to connect in new and different ways. They helped other people in recovering from abuse. Shame seeks to isolate us and healing only happens as we come out of isolation. Some of the most common ones have been visual and or auditory hallucinations and suicidal thoughts. I usually hear, I don't want to be put in the hospital, or, I don't want you to think I'm crazy. Also, basically anything sexual. I'm not going to judge you for being into BDSM, fetishes, etc. Honestly, I've probably heard it before and I'm not here to judge you. Same goes with any non-consensual experiences, especially if we're working through trauma. Every time I meet with a therapist for the first time I tell them I've had suicidal ideation almost non-stop since I was a kid, and that it's normal for me. The first time I got hospitalized, it was because I told someone I was having suicidal thoughts and they called the cops. The whole scenario was traumatic and I am terrified of it happening again. If I have any thought a therapist might try to hospitalize me because I'm having suicidal thoughts, which, again, are normal for me, then I can't trust them enough to be my therapist. It took me a long time to be comfortable saying it out loud without fear of hospitalization. OCD gets misunderstood a lot. It's not just having a clean house or liking things to be organized. Common intrusive thoughts can include violent thoughts of harming children and other loved ones, intrusive thoughts of molesting children, fear of being a serial killer etc. My clients can feel a lot of shame when discussing the thoughts or worry I will hospitalize them. Edit. Thanks for the awards kind internet strangers. Here are a couple quick resources for people who have or think they may have OCD. International OCD Foundation website www.iocdf.org The book Freedom from OCD by Jonathan Grayson. The YouTube channel OCD3. The app NOCD. Mine was intrusive thoughts about bad things happening to my pets and children, and I would obsess over them. Then it became, if I don't say out loud that I'm thinking this bad thing could happen, like child choking on a cracker while with their grandparents, then it will definitely happen. That spiraled into checking and rechecking seven to eight times the freezer every time I opened it to make sure a child or cat hadn't gotten in there without me seeing somehow, totally irrational, but my brain told me if I didn't check, it would have happened and been all my fault. Then the same thing started happening with the door and window locks, the dryer, the washer, nothing was off limits with my brain. It was wild. I ended up working through it on my own by reading a lot of what helped other people. But it was totally out of control and took over my whole life at one point. As someone in the substance abuse field I know that it's difficult for clients to tell me they got high with a parent but it's something I get told fairly regularly. It's kinda sad. I've had patients tell me their parents used to give them DG as kids to basically sedate them. It's soul crushing. Women often feel really ashamed when they tell me they are burnt out on being a parent or that they never want to have kids. I wish all of them knew how common this thought is. That they haven't had sex with their partner in years and don't know how, if they will ever have sex with their partner again. There is so much shame around sex in the USA that a lot of people are scared to talk to their partner about their sexual needs. Time goes by, and suddenly they haven't had sex in 3, 5, 10 years. It starts for a lot of people in their 40s and 50s. A lot of people, falsely, believe there is something wrong with their marriage because they fantasize about people other than their partner. My wife and I have been married seven years and I swear she turned asexual the past year. She gets upset if I put my arm around her at night because it interrupts her 45 minutes of scrolling through Instagram before she falls asleep. She accidentally put her arm on top of me one night and I still think about it sometimes because I miss being touched so much. Being tired of being a mother. There's this social thing of loving your kids and they should be the first thing in your life, but having a child is messy and a real hard work, is normal to just want to take a break once in a while from all that responsibility. I'm support worker, social worker, not a therapist. I've had clients too scared to tell me their accomplishments because they think they should only be bringing their problems to case management and that if we see them getting better that we won't care, prioritize them as much. Another is hard DG. We don't endorse it by any means but we have to know if we need to keep an eye out for inappropriate behavior and overdoses. We never get mad at them for being high, we just wanna send them to their room to sober up. 
What's scary is that for some people, expressing positive growth in some spaces, particularly outpatient therapy, does decrease priority for them. It's something I've had happen to me, and that I've seen happen to others, in outpatient clinic care, particularly low-income clinic care. The therapists at these clinics are massively overworked, and people with long-term problems aren't guaranteed long-term therapy, since the therapists need space for incoming patients. If you show signs of improvement, there starts to be subtle push toward leaving therapy, regardless of how chronic your condition is. A lot of lower-income people struggle to find long-term, consistent outpatient care if they need it. I have severe mental health problems, at a level that I know I will likely need to be in some level treatment for the rest of my life. I've been trying to find a therapist who will give me consistent care for years, and the closest outpatient, private practice with someone in the specialty I need, that also takes my insurance, is nearly 100 miles away. So I have no choice but to go to clinics, that's why the clinics are so swamped and understaffed. Essentially treat patients is get you in, fix you as best we can, get you out, to make sure that they can provide care to as many people as possible. It's scary that this is a real issue that faces a lot of lower income mentally ill people. That expressing positive growth could lead to a push out of care that people aren't ready for, because the level of resources needed for them isn't available. Asterisk asterisk positive growth can be really fragile without support, asterisk asterisk. I've left therapy three times as an adult, for these specific reasons, and I've ended up back at square one, practically unfunctional, within six months each time. Low-income people who need long-term outpatient care are often just screwed. Not sure if this is an issue outside of the US, as I've only experienced things here, and obviously therapy and social work are different worlds. Just wanted to include this because I thought it was relevant to point out that you actually can start to lose access to care by showing improvements. I very much agree with your point. Mental health care is not as much endorsed as physical health. Therapy takes years to get to the root of issues and traumas but they think it should be as easy as slapping on a cast and moving on. There is a large demand and not enough supply. In Canada, we have a lot of ways to get free therapy if you're okay with waiting three to six months for the initial meet and only meeting every two months after that or else you have to pay a crazy amount for private practice which I do for myself. That they hear voices. I've found that a lot of people aren't familiar with their own internal dialogue or self-talk and that this is typically normal internal processing. A lot of people think that they are hearing voices and hallucinating. There are some pretty simple questions we can ask to determine if it's hallucinating or just internal dialogue, and most often it's the latter. Edit, I want to clarify that not everyone has an internal voice. Some have none at all, some have more of a system of thoughts that aren't verbal, feelings, or images. That's normal too. Edit 2, thank you for the awards, I don't think I've ever had feedback like that. Phew. Edit 3, I am really happy to answer questions and dispense general wellness suggestions here but please please keep in mind none of my comments etc. should be taken as a substitute for assessment, screening, diagnosis or treatment. That needs to be done by someone attending specifically to you who can gather the necessary information that I cannot and will not do via Reddit. Could you share what some of these questions are? Edit to say, again, not everyone has their internal communication in words. That's normal. Edit again, please know this is not intended as a diagnostic tools and should not be used to diagnose yourself, or others, or rule anything out entirely. This was off the top of my head to give a general idea. If you, or anyone else are worried about symptoms you may have, please go get a full assessment and proper screenings. Without history and further information these questions are not enough. Sure, the direction it goes really is determined by their responses of course but typically I ask. Where do these voices seem to originate from? In other words, do you hear them from outside your head, like someone calling your name or shouting for example? Asterisk internal dialogue comes from inside your head, auditory verbal hallucinations typically are outside asterisk. Do you have control over the voices? People experiencing a VHVS internal dialogue tend to not have control over the voice. Can you give me an example of what these voices sound like and say? Asterisk internal dialogue often sounds like processing e.g., wow, that was embarrassing, why did you do that? I wonder what would happen if and can often be self-critical asterisk. Do you recognize any of the voices? Do they sound like the person's own voice, or have a real voice with an accent or different tones sound like someone they know etc. Asterisk internal speech usually sounds and feels like you, or a version of you e.g., critical self. AVH often sounds like another person, and may involve phenomena we associate with actual physical speaking, like whispering, shouting, echoes in the room etc. Asterisk. Do these voices ever try to control your actions or instruct you to do anything? 
If so, can you give me an example? Asterisk internal speech typically isn't controlling. Internal speech may have thoughts, feelings, speech like, you need to do laundry, but isn't going to be instructing you to do more extreme things, asterisk. How long have you heard these voices? How often do you hear them now? Do you have any delusions, or highly unrealistic beliefs particularly relating to yourself or your actions? Asterisk delusions can be related to real AVH, but not always. This is a tough question sometimes because a person really struggling with delusions, or in a manic cycle may not recognize the delusions for what they are, asterisk. It's important to note that auditory verbal hallucinations can happen in a variety of situations and contrary to common belief, are not always associated with schizophrenia. We can have AVH from physical illness like fevers, other mental health concerns like PTSD, PPA, anxiety and situational factors can play a part for example being really anxious while home alone and hear someone calling your name. Religious or cultural aspects can also be associated with or induce AVH and not be associated with mental health concerns. Edit, spelling, grammar and added a question I forgot. Edit 2, wow. Thanks for the awards friends. That's so sweet, brought a smile to my face. Recurring intrusive thoughts about harming others. Can be hurting, killing someone or sexual fantasies about children or relatives. Usually people take a while to admit those. The reality is that if you are having them frequently you aren't dangerous. You probably have OCD and are terrified that you might be dangerous. It was once explained to me that intrusive thoughts are often not things we're wanting to do, but our brain basically wants to bring it up and contemplate about something bad that asterisk could asterisk happen so it's ready to respond. I work in an older adult service for people with dementia and mental health problems. I see a lot of family members, carers feeling ashamed of the fact that they are finding it incredibly difficult to care for someone that has dementia or a chronic mental health problem. Carer burnout is a real issue and people need to know that it's not easy to see someone you love struggling every day, or slowly fading away month by month. Carers and family members desperately need time for themselves and need to know that it's okay to feel the way that they do. No one is superhuman and we all have our own needs. It's why we have therapy groups for carers. It's okay to struggle to look after someone and you should in no way feel ashamed of having those feelings. Edit, I am overwhelmed, in the best way, by all the people sharing their stories and relating to this. You are all amazing and I'm sorry I can't reply to all of your comments. Stay blessed folded hands medium skin tone. Five years into caring of my 100% disabled father and can't agree more. I always been dubious about therapy and all that but I know I need it. I'm burnt, mentally exhausted, desperate to have some time for myself, finding time to socialize and maybe a good relationship. Looks so hard and the only thing that makes me carry on is that I love him and he doesn't deserve to end his days in some elder's residence, something equivalent. He was there to raise me and support me for every stupid thing I wanted as a child and NPW it's time to give back. But damn, sometimes when I have to start the day feels like I'd throw me in a lake and F off everything. And hash x200b. And hash x200b. Edit. I'm flattered by the warming replies, thanks for the awards and some good person even gave me a reddit premium, I'm really stoked by the wave of goodness my post has triggered. Must add some things, in no particular order. Oh, forgive my grammar etc, I'm Italian so. I'm a casual redditor, read a lot but seldomly post, but this time as I read Aaron 24 carats post I just felt I also had to express my feelings somewhere, sometimes you just need to speak or write to someone even if it's a forum or whatever. My father had a stroke and stayed 199 days in hospital from the 30th of March till the 14th of October 2016, returning home with many cognitive problems and his brain neglecting his right side of the body, had his left part of the brain damaged, luckily he's still able to speak as he's left-handed, doctors said that sometimes functions such as language are located in the right side of the brain for left-handed people. He should have been dead, he should have been completely paralyzed, he shouldn't even talk, but somehow he's a damn oak tree and I love him for that. He can even stand up and walk very little distances, let's say from the couch to the dinner table, with my help, but mostly he moves on wheelchair and needs help for everything concerning primary needs. Had four epileptic crises in five years, just to add some more spice to it, so I have one more sword swinging above my head every day, when the next one will be. Tonight? The next week? Next month? Who knows? The worst thing of it all is living in total uncertainty of the future. I'm well past my 40s, can't have a job, no future, no plans at all and I know that anyway it's ending it's not ending well. 
no romantic relationship whatsoever. People always think it's about sex. No it isn't. Of course I miss it. But I miss more having a woman who can understand me with which I can share my thoughts, joys and fears, you know how it is. Simply at the current state of things it's not possible. The vast majority of women, run away, when they hear I live with my disabled father, no job and very little spare time to share. I can't even blame them, who would do that? But in all this disaster there's one good thing, before we never had a good relationship but now we are father and son more than ever as he understands that if I didn't truly love him I wouldn't be there for him. It sounds strange but we rediscovered each other thanks to the illness and I'm grateful for it. Sorry for the long edit but I felt I had a little more to add, I'll better cut it out here otherwise I'll write a hundred pages. And hash x200b. P.S. I'll try to reply to some posts in the night hours, thank you all for the kindness showed since it really gave me a little more fuel to carry on and be more positive about my life difficulties. Again, thank you all. Thank you for sharing your story, that must be incredibly difficult to have to deal with every day and you are amazing for being so dedicated to caring for your father. It's always inspiring to me to hear people explain how much their family truly means to them. I agree therapy seems like uncharted territory for someone who's not familiar with it but it can be anything you want it to be. It can be anything from a structured intervention to just half an hour to speak your mind freely and without judgment. I wish you and your father the best folded hands medium skin tone. Intrusive thoughts about sex with family members or, in their mind, nymphomania, as a result of childhood sexual trauma, and adult. Hypersexuality isn't often discussed as one of the PTSD symptoms, so people walk around with so much shame about it. Edit. Wow I just looked at the upvotes and awards and want to say thanks, but truly the best thanks is to help raise more awareness and reduce social stigma so more people feel comfortable seeking help. Easier said than done, obviously, but it is also why I share my own experience. I have intrusive thoughts about this stuff, I've had them since I was young. But I've never experienced sexual trauma, at least from what I can remember. Effing everything, dude. Everything. You name it, I've heard it. You regret having your child and wish you never became a mum? Okay, you love your spouse but their cancer came back again and you don't know how you can go through this fight again? Yeah, I get that. Hard DG? Who, it's been a hard year. You wanna quit your well-paying job to sell carved soap figurines? Okay well let's talk through what that might look like. You like to collect teddy bears because they give you a special little tingle in your nether regions? I don't kink shame. Seriously. We've heard everything, everything. Unless it's someone newish to the field, less than five years maybe, it's generally not going to shock us. And whatever it is, even if it does seem a bit of a unique circumstance, we'll get the underlying feeling under it. In the end, everyone wants the same overall things, to feel heard, to be loved, to take care of their loved ones, to manage stress, etc. Humans do the best they can, and therapists are there to help, but we can't provide guidance if you don't give us a chance, and that means opening up. I know it's scary and some therapists do suck. It's a lot like dating. If you don't click with the first one, move on until you find one you do click with. I'm usually more afraid that I'm boring them. Oh, you have anxiety about your normal job and normal family and we've been talking about it for a year now? Let's party, L. I have come across a lot of people who also think they'd bore a therapist with their everyday problems and that they don't want to take up resources for people who will need it more. I've even had clients who were very close to actual suicidal thoughts thinking that others are worse and will need the therapist more than they do. Clients usually try to compare the severity of their problems to the problems of other people. That doesn't work. As soon as somebody has the urge to talk about their problems, the client and their issue needs to be taken as seriously as the next clients. Be it a poo job, an unhappy marriage or hearing voices. Additionally, I highly appreciate talking about someone's pooty job instead of someone's severe depression because they thought they didn't need to do anything about it earlier. On the flip side I was afraid to tell my therapist about my suicidal fantasies. I was always told when you talk about suicide people assume you're seeking some attention or special treatment or that they lock you up in a psych ward. When I finally brought it up was told that's not true and a lot of people fantasize about suicide it is normal. I felt silly for thinking I was weird. Therapist here. Suicidal ideation is a lot more common than people think. 
it is when that fantasy starts turning into a specific plan that it becomes a safety concern. In my two years as a therapist, I have never had to EP anyone for self-harm risk, although have had several clients acknowledge that they were in a position where they felt it would be better if they did not exist. Honestly most things. People have weird thoughts all the time and it's not as uncommon as they think it is. I'm beginning to focus on a people experiencing prolonged grief. It's kinda cute when people come in and say, I'm ashamed to admit that I still cry every day five years after my mom's death. That's why you're here, to seek support for your grief. Then there's anything and everything related to sex. I had a patient who contracted a serious STD and didn't tell me for two months because they thought I'd be grossed out. Edit. Some people are taking issue with my use of the word cute. I'm not saying the grieving is cute, but the embarrassment. It's cute in the way watching a child learn a new skill is cute, the patient is learning how to grieve, and the way one fumbles through that expiration can be rather endearing. Thank you for watching. We upload new videos every day. So be sure to come back for more fun. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed the video.